Tom Zollner, author of An Island on Fire, The Revolt That Ended Slavery in the British Empire. Welcome to the show, Tom. Thank you. It's good to be here. So I'm really looking forward to speaking um, about your book because this takes place in the time between the Haitian Revolution and the Civil War. Uh, Haiti's been in the news recently, obviously. So I think this fits into a lot of what we've been talking about on this program uh, relative to Haiti. So let's just talk about and set the stage um, for Jamaica's 1831 revolt against slavery. Place us in that time period, if you could, between the Haitian Revolution and the Civil War, um, how ubiquitous was slavery in Jamaica at the time? I mean, I think I read in your book, nine out of every 10 Jamaicans were enslaved. So that's an incredible figure. Um, just give us some broader context and then we can begin to narrow things down. Sure. At that point, British slavery was in its 330th year. Uh, it was a, a, a lasting and an extremely profitable institution for uh, the empire. They uh, raised sugar as a monoculture that is to say, that was really the only thing going on in Jamaica was the production of this nutritionally worthless product, which nevertheless fueled uh, an addiction back in the mother country. And in order to raise it, uh, required this uh, unspeakably cruel institution, um, which uh, was multi-generational in nature, which uh, required uh, fear and torture um, to sustain it. And uh, what had happened uh, was that uh, missionaries, Christian missionaries from uh, the mother country, um, Baptists and Methodists primarily, had finally gained entrance um, to what were called the Sugar Islands and began to spread uh, the dangerous message that uh, people can be free. People can be free in a spiritual sense. And this uh, bled over into a more political message that we can be free in a material sense. And I want to touch on that because that was an inc incredible dynamic that you laid out. Um, but let's back up a little bit to uh, talking about how the British seized Jamaica in the first place uh, in the 1600s uh, and how that, that kind of set up an economy and an infrastructure for what we saw uh, 200 years later. Sure. Uh, when, when Britain deposed its king and uh, appointed uh, Oliver Cromwell, the Lord Protectorate, um, he had an aggressive foreign policy, uh, in particular something called that he called the Western design. Um, comparisons with uh, the modern day are always, you know, tricky, but, you know, this might be compared to, you know, the U.S. going into Iraq. Uh, this was this was this patriotic thing that we're going to seize the uh, Caribbean islands from the Spanish, and uh, <laughs> the seizure of Jamaica was kind of a comic opera. Nothing went right, um, but they, they they stumbled into a military victory and claimed what happened to have been uh, for them one of the most profitable islands in the in the Caribbean, and uh, that was where you really saw. Uh, slavery ramped up into a uh, commodity level um, concern. So, I mean, there were the twin, I guess, commodities of slavery and the role that Jamaica played in that, which I want to ask you about, and sugar. Um, so w w would you say those were the two primary uh, fundamental economic drivers uh, in Jamaica for the for the for Great Britain? No question. That, those were the twin foundations of the economy. Um, and so then talk a little bit more about the slave trade and Jamaica's role in the slave trade. Sure. Uh, Jamaica was what was known as the slave depot of the Caribbean. That is to say that kidnapped uh, human beings from Africa were taken primarily first to uh, Jamaica and then traded throughout uh, the rest of the British possessions in North America, um, The what would eventually become the United States among them. And so um, the harbor at uh, Kingston and Port Royal was the first site of the New World that uh, an enslaved person, a newly enslaved person, was going to see. And you know there are reports, uh, really vivid, heartbreaking reports of uh, a kind of a catatonia that would descend upon um, those who were entering a horrific new life at that point. You know they had already survived the Middle Passage. 
And uh, what they saw uh, in, in front of them was this uh, riotous uh, explosion of, of verdure, um, uh, the whips, uh, gangs, uh, this new language. Um, many enslaved people were afraid that the, the, the white people were going to drink their blood. Um, it, it brought a, a sense of overwhelming depression, uh, quite understandably so, among those who were exposed to this atrocity. Well, I mean, your first chapter of your book describes Jamaica as the suburb of hell, um, which, given the description of of the heat, of the brutality, of the frequency with which slaves would be killed within years of them um, arriving and being brutally forced into labor, of course, uh, for for years until they were seen as too old or too useless, not even allowed to breed uh, because it was cheaper to import slaves. I guess just if you could emphasize and you know talk about some of the the, the practices that made it so brutal, specifically in Jamaica. Sure, you, you mentioned a suburb of hell, and um, that's what uh, some folks in Britain were calling Jamaica. Actually, um, there was uh, never a, a unified enthusiasm back in the mother country for this practice. Um, there were jokes, for example, about um, the, the bricks of the city of Liverpool, which was Britain's uh, greatest uh, slave trading um, brokerage city, that those bricks were sealed with men's blood. Um, the uh, image of a, of, a, of a West Indian trader, which was, a, of course, a euphemism for slaveholder, uh, becoming a person of obnoxious, vulgar wealth. You know, that was a stereotype. And you know, there's a lot of truth to it you know, throughout uh, British society that these uh, folks who had profited from this atrocity um, were ridiculously wealthy. Uh, Gold-plated coaches, um, more wealth than... Um, the uh, the British monarchy, um, the Jamaica itself was regarded as kind of a wild west, uh, a place where uh, statistics showed that if you were uh, a, a young white man going, and they were almost all men, going to make their fortune in this atmosphere, that you could uh, you would have an income that was fifty seven times that of uh, one of your compatriots who had gone to New England. Was, wow! Yeah. I but mean, a bit of a a bit of a new money dynamic, right? Where right. It's seen as seen as gaudy, seen as ostentatious, and you know, uh, of a of a lower brow as well. Uh, correct. I mean, I, again, a rough comparison, not a, not completely accurate, but you might think of the way that uh, a well-bred uh, Bostonian of the you know early twentieth century might look at you know uh, an, an oil tycoon from Texas. Uh, great wealth, but you know the perception of a lack of breeding, a lack of, uh, in some, in morality for for many Britons who um, were never quite comfortable with uh, the enslavement of uh, kidnapped human beings. Right, right. Um, it was not genteel, I guess. Um, and and you mentioned Cromwell earlier. I wanted to ask, uh, and of course the English Civil War. Um, what was the a difference that you observed or that there was between British imperialism under Charles the first versus under Cromwell um, after he took over? Sure, that was a brief period of uh, exuberance and of jingoism and uh, British foreign policy. And the shape of the Caribbean today um, can be uh, largely attributed to the consequential events, you know, in that in that decade where um, who was going to be the colonial masters of what island um, was, was shaken out. Right. Um, I want to fast forward a little bit to, to then, now that we've kind of given a lot of the context for uh, that relationship with Jamaica, to Tacky's Rebellion in 1760. Um, because then, you know, of course, there were lessons learned for uh, what was to come in, in 1831. Talk a little bit about about Tacky's rebellion. Sure, um, and in so doing, I want to hold up a, a really good book by the professor Vincent Brown, who uh, wrote an eponymous uh, book about Tacky's rebellion. Tacky's rebellion, um, which uh, made the point um, that this was a long war. 
that uh, every five years or so, uh, uprisings of enslaved people, mass uprisings would happen um, in, in Jamaica and in the other uh, sugar islands, uh, some were larger than others. And this was regarded as a cost of doing business. You know, this was the reason why if you were a white person in Jamaica, a white man, um, you would be required to go out for militia service. Um, if you were between the ages of 16 and 60, that you were going to go out and cosplay soldier for a week out of every month and in preparation for an anticipation uprising uh, of enslaved people. And so Tacky um, anticipated some of what would happen in the 1831 rebellion. He uh, swore people to secrecy. Um, it was a desperate uh, military gambit, um, it largely uh, improvised, but yet one that also showed a, a, a military acumen, which uh, both frightened and impressed the British, you know, who had been conditioned to view um, uh, Afro-Caribbeans as sort of this inferior type of uh, type of human being, but you know it was in these uprisings that many of them were humbled and saw that you know there there was uh, a, a worthy and powerful foe, and to be ever more on their guard. And so to be living in the Caribbean during that time was to be, in the words of. Um, a, a, a French person in, in, in Haiti to be living on the edge of a volcano. And for our audience, what, what was the impact of, of Tacky's rebellion? What were the lessons gleaned from the enslaved population uh, and from the British, you kind of touched on it there, but who were, were prepared for m more tactical and um, organized rebellions going forward? Sure. I mean, part of the whole edifice of slavery represented on an assumption of racism, you know, that uh, there are there's a Aristotelian chain of, chain of being and that white people sit on top of it. And so, you know, the these rebellions were really the only way to kind of grab their attention in that way. Um, and there followed a, a, a ramped up sense of of paranoia and it reinforced with the enslaved people something that they already knew, which was that, you know, should they find a sense of solidarity in uh, military ways, um, in other ways, that uh, they could rise up and, and seize better conditions, um, better uh, pathways to freedom. Which takes us very well to the influx of Baptist uh, missionaries and Christian missionaries. Uh, in the uh, 1800s, which, of course, I mean, you, you, you talked about a little bit at the outset, um, set the stage for the rebellion that we saw. So is that one of the many differences um, in the 1831 rebellion? Was that there was kind of an ideological undercurrent of, of freedom and emancipation that was brought about by... Uh, Christian missionaries and, and, and that kind of percolated for a while? Yes. Uh, the, the, the primary difference was that this was the spirit behind the 1831 rebellion, which was the final one and the one that really brought um, true freedom, true material freedom um, to the enslaved people was that it was nonviolent in spirit, that uh, the, the, the white missionaries were able to set up little church groups, uh, circles of Bible readings, and they deputized um, enslaved people um, to uh, speak to fellow enslaved people, taught them to read, uh, which was regarded as an extremely dangerous thing to do, to bring literacy to an enslaved person. That was, that was dynamite. And one of those quote unquote deputies called the deacon was a guy named Sam Sharp, who began to fuse uh, a, a, a traditional Christian message that is to say, uh, the truth will set you free. No man can serve both God and mammon. He began to fuse this uh, with not just a spiritual promise, but a material promise. And in there was a little bit of uh, interpolation on his part. Um, he repeated a conspiracy theory, which was that the King of England, William IV, had signed a free, what was called free paper, uh, essentially an emancipation but that the white slaveholders of Jamaica were keeping this secret. And all that it would take 
um, to create freedom would be for the enslaved people on a given signal. Um, and he set a date, December 27th, that after the Christmas holiday, they were gonna all sit down, just sit down and refuse to work. It was a method of nonviolent resistance that anticipated later work by Gandhi and Martin Luther King. It was uh, a way of saying, if you want us to comply with this, uh, these repressive dictates, you know, uh, you are going to have to work extraordinarily hard for us to, to go along anymore. No mas. Well, then let's talk about, uh, let's talk about Sam Sharp and his significance, uh, given that his lessons were gleaned, as you say, uh, by, by Conti and Martin Luther King. Um, so who was he? Where did he kind of, I mean, for, from my, from reading your book, it seems like a lot of the power he held was the fact that he was literate and he was kind of treated as a favorite of um, his master, which allowed him to learn how to read. But, you know, who was he? How was he able to galvanize all of these enslaved people to this uprising? And, and what was his significance? Yes. Uh, as you pointed out, he was in a position of relative um, uh, uh, comfort for an enslaved person. He was uh, not uh, made to work in the fields. Um, while he was on trial, he uh, sh pulled up his shirt and showed his back to prove that he had never been whipped. Um, he was, uh, by all measures, an extraordinary person, um, one of uh, great command of uh, oratorical powers. There are stories about uh, people listening to him who emerge trembling at the, at the strength of his oratory, at the, the levels to which he was, uh, could inspire loyalty. And this life-risking step of refusing to work, that was almost unheard of, um, especially when it came to mass gatherings. I mean, this was really inviting torture and death. So he was able to cultivate uh, little cells, um, small groups that spread this message, this nonviolent message, and this, you know, what amounted to a conspiracy across 70 miles of Northwest Jamaica. And by the time the final plans were laid, almost 60,000 people had heard of it, which, um, first of all, that's an extraordinary reach, you know, far beyond what uh, Tacky uh, was able to achieve in terms of laying the groundwork and in terms of getting people on board. And especially in um, a repressive society, word of this could not help but leak out before the time of the, uh, the appointed sit down. Right. Um, well, I guess, I mean, I could ask you to take us through the rebellion now, but I think maybe we could set the stage a little even better just to circle back to baptism and to the religious fertile ground that uh, was made it, I guess, you know, fertile ground for this this slave rebellion. Um, William Nib, some of the other people that you focus on in your book, if you could just talk about them a bit. Sure. These are the white uh, Baptist and Methodist missionaries that were reluctantly allowed into Jamaica, which was not a religious place. You know, the slave owners were nominal members of the uh, Church of England, which did very little um, to improve conditions. Certainly, they were not voices for emancipation. Um, the, the, the message, the more urgent uh, message of the um, Baptists and the Methodists was that you can have new life. You can uh, renew yourself through uh, belief in Jesus Christ. And this came along, especially with the Baptists, with the ceremony in which you were dunked in water, you were dressed in white. There was a dignity of the individual. Uh, in these rituals and in this theology, which was alien to the enslaved experience in Jamaica. And because the uh, Protestant road to salvation runs through the Bible and runs through understanding of the scriptures, this came along with necessary lessons in literacy. And there are uh, really extraordinary accounts of what would happen to uh, an enslaved person when they were taught to read. There was a there was an awakening, a sense of uh, awareness of their uh, condition in a way that hadn't been present before. This isn't to say that they weren't aware of exactly what was going on, but there was a new level 
of um, understanding that it didn't need to be this way and of a political reality, particularly of what was happening back in England, that there actually was an abolitionist movement, that um, there were white people across the ocean that uh, wished them well and that were on their side. Samuel Sharp, who was able to um, get a hold of the newspapers that were thrown off the ships at the dock at Montego Bay, let them know that there are white people who are our friends here and that we're going to uh, join hands with them. And, you know, Sharp was one of the deacons of, um, of, of I think, what, the Baptist congregations there. Correct. So uh, talk about the role of deacons in some of this organizing effort. Sure. The, 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 the white missionaries perceived that um, the message was going to be a lot more effective if, if it happened on a small group level. You know, there was effectively two types of preaching that was going on. The, 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 the mass um, uh, lecturing that we might associate with, uh, with a collegiate lecture hall, you know, that, that's the, the white missionary standing up in front of a, a, a large congregation. Um, those of us who uh, attend religious services will be very familiar with this. And then there's the more intimate sort of kind of small group where it's more of a loose, uh, almost Q and a kind of a, um, um, a format, almost like a Bible study. And uh, the uh, deacons in those cases were uh, almost always uh, either enslaved people or what were called free people of color. So, it, I mean, it gives one uh, people of color or uh, enslaved people, um, I guess enslaved people in this case, this pers this idea that they can they can have agency one through the scripture but also through the leaders that are speaking to them um with with sharp being one of them which i think is um one of the fascinating wrinkles of this and also how this was kind of a lesson in political organizing that we could see and use to this day one that there's this macro level um organizing effort and that it's also quite communal and smaller which was just you know really I, excellent in terms of the lessons that we could learn on the left here in the United States. Surely. And in fact, uh, this was a real revelation for me. This was one of the real uh, surprises of this book was that, you know, let's be clear, the British were incredibly embarrassed by this revolt, revolt and did everything they could to erase it. And we're talking here about, of course, the, uh, uh, the British colonial government. All right. And so Sam Sharp was uh, was hung in um, May, May 23rd, 1832, and was they tried to immediately forget him. And so it would not be accurate to say that Sam Sharp inspired Gandhi or inspired Martin Luther King. Um, mm -hmm. They hadn't heard of him. Uh, very few people uh, outside of Jamaica, outside of Jamaican Christian circles, had heard of this guy until 1975, which is a whole other story. Um, but what I concluded after looking at Sam Sharp's methods and seeing how closely uh, they had been um, used, uh, emulated, that's even the wrong word because they weren't aware of it, how, how they've been duplicated, let's put it that way, by groups as disparate um, as uh, the French resistance against the Nazis, uh, the Irish Republican Army, the civil rights movement in the U.S., this convinced me, and this goes a little bit beyond the scope of the book, that these methods of resistance, uh, which involve a specific way about going about things, are almost latent in nature. You know, the same way that genetics are latent within uh, flesh. You know, the same way that some atomic structure is, is there within elements. It just is there for those who want to discover it. And Sam Sharp, in a uh, incredibly repressive, out of the way place, discovered these elements of resistance. It's it's you know it's incredible uh, in in the the ways that it has been duplicated. Um, and I then I guess this is a good opportunity to take us through the rebellion in and of itself uh, and and what went down. Um, if you could just do that for us. Certainly. So I've mentioned December 27th as the agreed upon start date. And when the sun went down, the people sat down and then the plantations went up. 
That is to say, um, burning commenced in a specific location on a chain of plantations. It was called the trash house. This is where the waste product from the sugar cane, um, which was called bagasse, the French term, where enslaved people uh, lit that part of uh, the, the sugar estates on fire as what's been called a flaming telegraph to signal to the northwest part of the island that it's game on, that uh, this is happening, this wasn't a rumor. It's now up to you, if you've sworn to do this, to join in solidarity with us and sit down and refuse to work. And there are vivid descriptions of, of, of these fires. No one who saw this ever uh, could forget it, the way that the Caribbean sky looked um, with these orange flames. Uh, creating this, this vermilion glow in the sky. Um, this terrified the, the white ruling class. The militia was immediately called out into the field. The small detachment of the King's army that was uh, at a garrison post in Kingston boarded ships, sailed around to the north side of the island. And then uh, what followed was five weeks of, uh, of chaos. Um, Sheriff's rebellion was nonviolent. But he also made it, he also, the evidence indicates he made it clear, look, if, you know, if they're going to come and try and take your life, you can fight back. You can fight to preserve your life. And what was uh, some of the death that we saw? It was almost all white on black violence, not surprisingly. Um, the official death toll uh, has never been calculated. I found evidence to indicate it was between five and 600 enslaved people who were either shot on site in the field, uh, not even in the context of battle, this descended into human hunting. Um, these quote unquote uh, drumhead court martial trials, which lasted five minutes if you were lucky and resulted in immediate firing squad or hanging. Um, for, as I've said, uh, a period of weeks, the enslaved people held the upper hand tactically. And what's remarkable to me was that the death toll among whites was so low. Um, the official count reached years later was 14. Uh, I found evidence to indicate that was exaggerated, that there were really only two confirmed deaths of uh, white people, and one of those was in combat. So, you know, given the enormous abuse that enslaved people had suffered and that they had an opportunity to wreak havoc, revenge, on their white masters and did not do it um, was, I think, incredible testament to Sharp's message of nonviolence. That's uh, that's unbelievable. And and you mentioned that he was executed um, some months later. Uh, I guess just talk about him and his legacy a little bit more. Um, what how his trial went down the effects of that um and then of course i want to touch on the aftermath of, of of what this caused in terms of slavery abolition right as i mentioned uh he was hung they they uh, took longer months longer than they normally would have they wanted to interrogate him day after day to uh, first of all understand if there were any co-conspirators still on the loose Secondly, to learn what they could about those methods of resistance that I, I was talking about earlier, you know, dividing into um, cells, a decentralized structure. You know, the, the British wanted to, to understand this to forestall future rebellions, and then they hung him and tried to erase him. But it was too late. Um, news of this, you know, the astonishing scale of this rebellion had reached London a month later, which was the amount of time it took to cross the Atlantic. And this uh, was a second, if you will, island on fire. This galvanized the abolitionist movement. Uh, and more than that, it was a wake-up call to Parliament and to the colonial office that the expense of maintaining slavery was just going to be too much. Um, to make another modern analogy, it was the rather cold-blooded calculation uh, that this country has had in getting out of Vietnam getting out of Iraq, getting out of Afghanistan, the notion that uh, the cost-benefit analysis is just not there. And so while there was a sense of Christian charity, there was a sense of uh, secular humanitarianism that propelled this, uh, 
the mentality on the part of parliament and the colonial office uh, was real politic. That the expense and the loss of prestige that it was going to take to maintain this institution was too great. And so um, this was reparations in, in order. And reparations, unfortunately, not to the enslaved people who had been, of course, uh, unspeakably wounded by this, but to the slave owners. Um, 20 million British pounds was partitioned among uh, those who lost their quote unquote human property to abolition. You mentioned reparations in the news recently. Jamaica um, is at least announcing that they're trying to seek reparations from the British government for the institution of slavery. Um, I guess in in our broader conversation about the aftermath of this rebellion, talk about the necessity of that. <laughs> yeah, this is a long conversation, and there is absolutely no question that uh, this is, I don't want to say a forever wound, uh, but this just doesn't magically go away. Um, the Caribbean was uh, horribly hobbled, not just by um, the unspeakable pain behind this institution, but um, the, the, the debt and the, the, the way that these uh, independent nations were starting far, far, far beyond the starting line. Uh, Haiti was famously crippled by uh, reparations owed to the French. Um, Jamaica became fully independent in 1962, um, but I don't think anyone's gonna argue that it really has a, a fair shake uh, on, on the global stage. So this is, this is a long conversation and a complicated one. Uh, Britain, by the way, just paid off only a few years ago the, uh, the debt it took to pay off the slave owners. Um, one more point I'd like to make about this deal. It didn't make anybody happy in 1834 when it was, sorry, 1833 when it was being hashed out. Um, first of all, abolitionists quite rightly said, why are we paying off these guys? You know, <laughs> they don't deserve this money. Right. You know, these are criminals. Why are we, why are we paying these slave owners? Uh, slave owners, of course, hated it because it was going to be a, a, a severe disruption of their way of life. And, you know, maybe in the uh, old saying, you know, that's how you know a deal is okay because no one's quite happy with it. You know, this was like a, this really boring bargain that was cut. And it was a lesson that the United States failed to heal, failed to heed that, you know, I think a, an argument could be made that our uh, extremely destructive civil war could, might have been headed off without that, you know, uh, high cost in blood. Um, had we looked to the British to see a way that uh, this, this, this ghastly institution might have been ended in um, a, a political fashion instead of a military fashion. So, yeah, I mean, they essentially bought out these slave owners, right? Which is just, it's uh, it, it, fascinating to me. And, and the French did the same in Haiti, uh, which it, it's similar to some of the outrage that we see now about buying out criminal or criminals in say the big banks um people who've wreaked untold havoc on our society as opposed to reparations for the harmed um now as as you say drawing parallels to today's society can be crude but helpful at least in this instance yeah it helps us understand uh, a little bit of the mentality of a, of a different time and you know it's it's worth saying again that this 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 deal was not loved and you know it, it for example created five more years of effective slavery you know uh, every enslaved person in the caribbean british and the british caribbean knew that they weren't truly free uh and even then you know life wasn't puppies and roses through the rest of the 19th and early 20th century this was hard agricultural labor the you know debt peonage it, it, right. it, it was terribly unromantic, um, but most history is terribly unromantic. And we reach uh, these goals in a stumble bum sort of way. Right. And um, I mean, you mentioned the United States briefly. How did the, pa uh, the passage of the Slavery Abolition Act uh, in Great Britain impact at least the um, the conversation surrounding abolition in the United States, and you, of course, we could have avoided uh, much of the bloodshed that you talk about. But in terms of what it's it it, it spurred 
uh, what it created and, you know, what lessons were taken. Yeah, it was an enormous galvanization for the abolitionist movement in the United States, for sure. Here was a great world power that had done away with this, this institution, found a way to do it in a way that, again, was completely flawed. Uh, but nevertheless, um, in, in Samuel Sharp's brilliant vision, largely nonviolent. You know, that, that isn't to take away the sacrifice of the more than 500 people who died in the course of this um, rebellion, which was in this crowning irony. Uh, it was a military failure, but it was an overwhelming political success. And uh, people like William Lloyd Garrison, the famous uh, abolitionist publisher in Massachusetts, um, took this as a sign that abolition in the U.S. is inevitable. And he was right. Um, the official day of British emancipation, August 1st, became a holiday in the United States. August 1st day, this was Juneteenth, before there was Juneteenth. This was a time for uh, uh, black and white people to come together and to have not a commemoration of a historic event so much, which it was, it was a commemoration of British abolition, but it was a forward-looking holiday. It was a time looking forward to the uh, day which uh, was, was going to arrive without fail that the U.S. would emancipate its enslaved people. And they were right. It took 30 years. Um, but the forces that, were, that had gathered in the British Caribbean landed eventually in the United States. And lastly, I mean, both you know, all these nations that uh, engaged in slavery, there's still not sufficient reparations or structures that adequately deal with what slavery has done. I mean, I, I guess compare, contrast, or reckon with what we're still dealing with in the wake of this institution. Oh, the scars are, are, are centuries long uh, in, in terms of uh, undiversified economies. Um, there are Jamaicans who will call tourism the new sugar. You know, you go to these all-inclusive resorts, particularly ironically, um, and the, the clustered in the same places where the uh, 1831 rebellion broke out. Um, in Montego and, Bay, right? Yeah, right? yeah. yeah. The, the, the tourist center of, uh, of of Jamaica also happens to have been the center of the consequential rebellion that would transform the island. Um, unfortunately, very few North American or European tourists really learn about that. So I could go off on all inclusive resorts, but uh, that's probably another subject. Yes. Um... The food also is quite poor yeah. at those all-inclusive resorts, but uh, less important, obviously, than the history that we discussed today. <laughs> Tom uh, Zollner, author of Island on Fire, The Revolts That Ended Slavery in the British Empire. Uh, thank you so much, Tom, for your time today. It's been a pleasure, Emma. Thank you. Folks, there's more of what you have just saw, where that came from. That's if you hit the subscribe and like button. Thank you. Really, thank you.